Hello and welcome. I am the Letter Hack, and with me now is a very special guest. And I'm not just saying that this time. <laughs> oh, so you just say that for all of everyone else to make them feel welcome? You're just like, this is a special guest. This is the sure. channel's very first mod ever. <laughs> Yes, and... I volunteered for it. I I offered before you even asked. Well, but now we're all mods. Yeah. So like to be the first, that's huge. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, very special guest indeed. Artist, friend of the show, host of their own popular YouTube show, Left of the Box. It's Sandy Lovis. Sandy, thank you for being here. How are you? Ah, oh, thank you for having me on. I am doing well today. Um. Like I was saying, you're not just a friend of the show. You are also a friend of mine. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, you have called in. You have hung out here and there. But this is the official interview and drawing. Mm -hmm. So well, it's nice to have that confirmation that we're friends. I'm autistic. I have a hard time telling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, and I'm I'm definitely not the kind of guy that's like, hey, how's it going? Just wanted you to know we're friends. Talk to you later. I am not. But that sometimes guy. <laughs> I need that because sometimes I think I'm friends with somebody and then I find out that they're like, oh, we're just like acquaintances. Like I this I, is a bit much. <laughs> I actually told somebody recently, I said, You're gonna think we're not friends, and then I will throw myself in front of a bus for you. Even if you aren't in danger, I'll just do it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am that kind of guy. I'll drop everything and help somebody out if I can. But Because mm. I thought we were friends, so it's good to have that confirmation. <laughs> well, you were right. Um, I'm nervous because I'm going to draw you, right? Mm -hmm. Normally, the guest is nervous, but like you're this very talented, accomplished artist. You can draw really, really well. So... He just got a sneak peek of a drawing I'm going to reveal later this month. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm trying not to spoil that. Mm -hmm. But this is the thing, though. Like, I've had artists on here, and I'm like, I'm not drawing this person. They're an artist. So this is another first where I'm going to draw an artist. So anyway. Well, you've drawn me before several times. Yeah, but not while you were sitting there watching me, ah, right? So, so like, I we're start, all in like, the hot leaning seat. in and start, like, Mm, yeah. that line i'm not too sure <laughs> keep it to yourself probably it'll be okay <laughs> well Friend. i do as i usually do remind you i envy your ability to draw cartoons because that is not something i can do yeah right i don't I believe do that for a realistic second high detail stuff to just I know. draw a cartoon of somebody is like beyond my capability just use like four of the lines you normally do <laughs> it'll be perfect well, then it's just, I've traced the person, like, that's it. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Just basically do that. Um, okay, I do want to ask you a lot about, not a lot, but I do want to ask you in detail about your art and your process and all that. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about, you know, a variety of things. But, as I always do, while I get in on tonight's drawing, um, which is in a different style, I'm debuting a different style than normal, so I don't know why I do this to myself. <laughs> I'm in the hot seat more than anybody else right now. Um, but anyways, I, I was hoping to get you to give us some of your origin story. Mm -hmm. And so would you mind telling us a bit about yourself um, as an artist and and a YouTube show host and, and how maybe one led to the other or informs the other? How mm -hmm. do you end up live streaming and doing art and all of that? Well, it's all connected, oddly enough. So, once upon a time, I finally got a stable job. And with that stable job, I was able to pay off my debts, take care of my mental health and things of that sort. And that's when I really felt like I was able to give back to the community, to finally go out there and challenge myself and do things. And I felt a calling to get involved with politics. And because you always, there's such a lack of representation. And I'm the type of person of, you know, I'm not going to sit around and complain about something if there's something I can do about it. Hmm. And I did some research into it, and I was trying to figure out where could I have the biggest impact in activism or in politics. And I settled eventually on doing politics. I was already involved with some levels of activism in the community with some groups and things of that sort. 
And so I put my hat in the ring for federal candidate in my area. Now, what which, is that? Uh, so, comparison, uh, federal, please. Yeah, federal. So, countrywide representative. So, is that like a senator? Is that like a congressperson? How's that uh, compare to? Uh, we don't elect senators here. Oh, okay, right. So, member of parliament. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and, um, I thought my chances were really good because nobody else was applying for the job. The person who had ran the previous time didn't want to again because running for politics can destroy a person <laughs> in so many different ways. But the challenges, the things that they feared were not the same things that would get me because just different life experiences, different stresses and things of that sort. So I put my hat in the ring and was a candidate but it was a contested nomination so at the very last moment somebody else also entered the race and mm. this person was actually heavily supported by the uh, establishment within the NDP and despite everything I had done tried to do for the previous year and a half leading up to this I lost that nomination by just a sliver like probably two or three votes that's a bummer so mm -hmm. how so they come in at the last minute yep wow okay last minute and like i said that person had the establishment behind her because she was an academic she was picked like they approached her they wanted her to run um and she had all the help from the higher ups and the volunteers when it came to emailing people calling people Whereas when it was just me, like I, I had to do all the work, partly because I felt like if people were going to vote for me, they had to actually talk to me and get to know me. And that did impress a lot of people because they saw, okay, you're going to do the work. You're going to get out there. You're going to talk to people. You're going to do the door knocking. And that was all very true. And come the actual um, uh, vote, the vote meeting, for the uh, selection, we both gave a speech and I got people clapping, laughing, resonating. If anyone went to that meeting undecided, they picked me. So there were other things that I still haven't talked about to this day, but I probably will at some point that just ripped me apart to the core, that whole experience something in it it just it shattered a part of me i didn't know was capable of being shattered and i had to step away from life i didn't know where to go after that i didn't know what to do like i was questioning my faith in the universe like it was really bad what i went through but after that you know i was still watching shows at that time i was still watching tyt majority report you know looking at at least there's people out there that are able to make that change or help influence people people like michael brooks and i was really lost and in a dark place because i had no direction in my life anymore i had nothing that i felt like i had faith in not even myself and i lost a huge part of me in that and i was in a very very dark place if people are catching my drift with that. Basically, I was just waiting for another low. A, a time when things were just bad enough that I could finally go to rest. But then, Michael Brooks. He got me, like, it was just who he was. And then one time, just watching him and stuff, he actually got me to ask the simple little question of why am I still here because you know I had wanted to end things multiple times I did want things to be over but for some reason I'm still here I've stuck through it and when I actually asked myself that question and listened to the answer it was because I really like who I am and who I am is this outgoing, compassionate, driven, 
strong, funny person, a person willing to go to bat for others, a person willing to stand up and fight for what's right. And I got there because Michael Brooks was able to break through that noise in my head and shine some light in the dark. And once I reclaim that part of myself, it's kind of like, okay, so now what? Like, what do I do? How do I get involved? How do I help make this change, this positive progressive change in the world? Because politics was a fail that obviously wasn't going to work. And then I thought, why not the same way as Michael Brooks? And that is when my channel, Left of the Box, uh, first started to formulate in my head. Tragically, unfortunately, this was right at the same time he passed away, that it kind of came to this revelation. So I never had a chance to reach out to him, to talk to him, to get any advice or even connect with him in any way. So that was, you know, quite depressing and sad. And it's just everyone lost out with him. Like everyone lost. He was just so important, such a bright light, so informative, so compassionate, like just, yeah, everything about him. But then we get on to the process of me starting my YouTube channel and I had no experience. I had a couple friends who were able to help me a little bit with an editing program. I got a cheap ass webcam. I got, like, I had no idea what I was doing. So many audio issues to begin with. I look at my old videos that I started off with and they tell you at the beginning you, that you're going to not want to see, like you're going to want to take down all your old videos. And I was like, nah, not me. I'm going to keep them up for, you know, reasons of like <laughs> documenting my progress. And I'm like, later on, I'm like, nope, this one's down. This one's down. This yeah. one's down. <laughs> Cause it's like, yeah, they're really bad. <laughs> Just my flow and everything. But part of getting, my own YouTube channel and trying to promote myself was actually joining social media because before my campaign run, I actually wasn't on any social media. I didn't even have a Facebook page at that point. And so the only thing I had now at that point was a Facebook page, which I never used. And that's when I joined Twitter. And that is when my world opened up in so many ways. Like, it really helped me connect to a part of the world that I've been missing out on. And I had been very nervous about joining social media. And part of it is my dyslexia, my inability to spell has kept me away from a lot of online social media things. Cause there used to be a time when uh, spell checks weren't so built into things. Mm -hmm. And I was, it was very difficult for me to communicate to people because I would have dumbed down my sentences so much to make sure that I could spell everything in that sentence. And even now, spell check looks at what I'm writing sometimes and like, whatever, you got me. <laughs> I then have to like Google the word that I'm trying to spell because my spelling is so bad. And also I understood at a very younger age sarcasm does not translate online and that was my primary way of communication yeah uh, there's no sarcasm font yeah i wish there was there's still they've started to do like the slash s but it's like no no you need like mm -hmm. a proper smiley face emoji for it yeah whatever that would be i don't know <laughs> so i had stayed away from social media and then i'm like so regretting it because twitter was my jam like it really was the quippiness, the interactions, the, the short, like conversation things, the ways that you could follow and meet people and stuff, post pictures. Like I didn't like Facebook, but Twitter was like this thing of like, oh my God, this has been here my entire life and I've never joined. What is wrong with me? Um, and this, and from there I started reaching out to people on the left and trying to build my you know, following on Twitter and stuff. And I kept on coming across these drawings of this person named Letter Hacks, these cartoon <laughs> characters that were really fun and stuff. And then one time I'm looking through this and Sam even shouted it out on his show that particular year where you said for your birthday, you wanted other people to do drawings of Sam and the majority reporter, people like that. Now, on to a different branch of this story tree. 
<laughs> I used to be very talented in art when I was young. Extremely talented. Definitely had a gift. The short of it is, I got into a very bad relationship. I ended up unhoused in Toronto, living in shelters and stuff, and I got into a very bad relationship. And during the almost year I was with this person, I didn't draw a single picture or sing a single song. Uh, so that was a good indication something was wrong. But yeah. I didn't know it at the time because I was still struggling with dire poverty. We were just getting out of the shelter system. We had moved in together um, to get out of the shelter. And once that relationship ended and I realized that, I tried to sit down and draw and it wasn't good and that devastated me to a point like it's it's hard to explain how bad that felt because that losing the ability to draw was more painful than anything else i had gone through with this guy with everything just it was my biggest regret in life was losing my ability to draw and what that meant to me. And over the years, every now and then I would try, but then it would get really bad again. And then I'd have to step away because the devastation I would feel from it, the hurt and the pain was too much. It was, I, I couldn't handle it. But now here I am on Twitter you know, trying to branch off, trying to grow my platform, you know, just trying to see what I'm capable of. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I could draw something that's so bad it's good. <laughs> that's like everything I do. <laughs> like, that is literally what I was thinking. Like, maybe, maybe, you know, because it's out there, it would help bring attention to my my Twitter handle and hopefully my channel if I start in with this and you know maybe he would get liked by Sam Cedar even because he was liking some of the drawings and stuff and I thought okay you know what I'll, I'll give it a shot I'll give it a shot and this was the first time that I really just sat down and I pushed through a lot of the bad of the drawing because the thing about a lot of drawings is sometimes they don't look good until they do yeah yeah, yeah, and yeah. so you have to push back past your doubts and everything. And as I was drawing and just hearing the way the pencil would scribble, it was bringing back memories of it. And every time I wanted to stop, I just heard this voice in my head literally say, you know, just relax and trust your instinct. And then at some point while I'm doing this drawing of Sam, I see this spark of, oh my God, like I actually, I got it. Like I got, this is a drawing, like it's a drawing drawing of him. And there was just that spark of like life in this drawing. And I had to step away from the drawing because I was crying and I didn't want tears to get all over the paper. <laughs> and, and it just, it, it blew me away also at how easy it was to get to that point of doing that drawing and so right away i went through my photos and five photos selected themselves for me to draw uh, and i sat down and i'm like okay i'm going to try drawing these two like what if this one portrait of sam cedar was a fluke and i sat down and i did these other drawings and each time i ended up just bawling my eyes out because they were so good and every time when I started it I'm like I have no idea how I'm going to do this I don't think I can do this and then I would just push through and then this time whenever this doubt came out this voice in the back of my head would like smack me across the face and say look at the portrait you just did if you can do that you can draw these leaves <laughs> And from there, it just kept on going and going. And the more I drew, the better it got. And now I'm looking at the portraits that I'm doing now. And it looks like that original portrait I did of Sam was done in crayon. Like, it's just the, the stark difference in just three years of drawing. I'm doing stuff now 
I never did, even in my prime when I was younger, like not even close. Like, and the thing is, is that it is so easy for me. I'm not even thinking about it. It's like I'm watching that... the pencil. <laughs> this is okay. First of all, your artwork looks like a photograph that somebody put a pencil filter on. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's that realistic. <laughs> it's amazing. And for me, I, and I'm deliberately interrupting you because I got to ask for me, when I, I see it in my mind's eye, I know what I want to draw and I know what I want it to look like. I can even see it in my own style. And the second my pencil hits the paper, there's a disconnect and it goes away. It's like I, a, it's like I'm suddenly blind and I start to struggle and it's not doubt. It's just, I can't, there's a real genuine disconnect. So it feels like when people draw something and it's like, I assume that what you mean by you're drawing it and it's good, it is what you see in your mind. It's what you intended it to look like. And it feels like it's magic when your pencil just brings that about. Cause I've seen your time lapse. I've seen your work in stages, the step-by-step -step progress, and I can't figure that out. What is the emotion or the sensation attached that, that comes along with that moment where it's good? Yeah. Uh, when I started drawing, I'm kind of in a similar place. Like, I don't know how this happens. And so at first, when I was still doing the drawings, there was still a lot of fear of like, what if I can't do it? Because it doesn't feel like it's something I'm consciously thinking of. It just seems to happen. So what happens if this magic just disappears? But now it's to the point, like this last drawing that I drew that I'm going to be revealing later on this month. Um, there was just a weird sense of, because what I do with the portraits is I do trace the initial outlines. Uh, mm -hmm. just to get the positioning and the portions and stuff right. But when you see, like when I do these time-lapse things and you see these really shoddy outlines of uh, the the person, and then you see how that transforms into this very lifelike, full of emotion drawing. I look at that and I don't know how it happens. Is it happiness? Is it satisfaction? Is it amazement? Is uh, it undescribable? Is it what people get when endorphins are popping off in their there, head? There's, there's amazement in it. Like, yeah. just in awe of it. Because like I said, it's like, I'm not even consciously thinking about what happens. It's like, all of a sudden, oh, the pencil needs to go here. And then the pencil needs to go here. And I do have a little bit of worry and stuff until I hit a certain point where the picture says hello to me. So it's like the person I'm drawing just suddenly says hello. And then that's when I know, okay, I've got it. Because with this drawing that I just did, it's the second attempt. The first one, I wasn't feeling it, even though I had worked on it for a bit. And I'm just like, it's not there. It's not in here. And then I started the second one and it didn't take too long for me to just feel like, Oh, no, this is it. This is it. The person's there. The person is in there. I got it. And once I've hit that point, I relax a lot because I know it's going to turn out. And I'm just, it's weird because like with this last one in particular, I'm, it, it's very highly, highly detailed. Yeah. And at one, and it happens with the other drawings too, but with this one. It was just more notable for a very specific reason. Uh, as I'm drawing, all of a sudden I'll just get a sense of what pencil I need. So for those of you who don't do pencil art, uh, there's H pencils and B pencils. And B pencils are softer lead, so they are darker and the H pencils are harder. And that's the only reason why I remember H and B is H is hard. And the higher the number, the harder it is and the lighter it is. Although you have to be careful with the really hard pencils because they're super hard and they can scratch the paper. <laughs> this is great. We talk about this in the Discord all the time. Mm -hmm. I've got people like drawing for the first time in years over there. Mm -hmm. Really exciting. But as I'm drawing, all of a sudden I'll just get a sense of, 
Oh, now it's time for the 3B pencil. Or, um, nope, this is the B pencil. This is the 2H pencil. Like, I'll just, I'll have this sense of this is the pencil I need. And then while I was doing this last one, all of a sudden it's like, I need the H pencil. And I grabbed the H pencil and I started working with it. And it was the right pencil for the job. I've never actually drawn with the H pencil before. I didn't even know how dark it was before this I picked is, it up. This is amazing. It's borderline frustrating for me because <laughs> because i i love that the process has a technical aspect to it but it, there's still a degree of the unknown mm -hmm. like when when did you first discover it's it's like i always want to ask artists when they first discovered art but also were you immediately inspired to create or did did that happen totally separate? Because for me, the first time I saw like a comic book, I said, I want to make one. But I just did. I didn't know what I was doing or why I thought that. I just wanted to contribute. I wanted to make what I love so much. Is that how it happened for you or was it separate? Uh, it was it was always there as a child. Uh, different mediums. It didn't really matter. Painting, sculpting. I was always far more creative than the other kids and cats in the class like even if the teacher was doing a step-by-step -step, like here's a paper or mache thing you're doing and and everyone's would basically look similar at the end i would be like well how can i do this but different and i was experimenting with color like i had no problems blending colors and paint and things of that sort and it was just always there for me and even at a very young age like in elementary school and I would see some kids, they get a lot of praise because they were really good at math or really good at sports. But you never really got that with art. Hmm. But I remember thinking, I would rather have this than any other skill. Like, no matter how much praise, no matter how much it might help me in life, I, I, I want this art, this ability to do art. And at that age, I knew I was just scratching the surface of what I was capable of. And maybe if I lived in a household where it wasn't so <laughs> stressful, um, I might have been able to work on it in a more healthy sense. But, you know, I would just have this urge to do different drawings and paintings. And art class was always big for me in school and just what I was capable of and doing and trying. Although I rarely got recognized in high school and in junior high and stuff because it'd be like oh we're all doing these clay sculptures but then somebody else would get like the top prize in the clay sculpture even though objectively speaking it wasn't as good as mine but for some Listen reason you. that's awesome <laughs> were you telling people that were you like uh, objection mine no better. no i would never say that to people it's but like the other it. ones were good but they weren't Right. They weren't that creative for one thing. They weren't that highly detailed. Like it was just like, oh, that's something somebody else has already done, but slightly different. <laughs> I, in my school, there were far better artists than me, mm -hmm. much higher caliber, and they would get their stuff put on display. And I'm like, mm -hmm. man, they painted a bar of soap. What? That's not impressive. Of course, it was. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was like I painted every single person at my table in this class and it made them look weird. Are you not impressed with this? This is yeah, awesome, right? Like, why is this not cool? <laughs> it's like they don't reward outside of the box thinking creativity. Right. You know, it has to be like everyone was meant to draw this bar of soap and whoever did the bar of soap best. Yeah. But it's like, well, if I did the bar of soap, but with this and that and the other thing, and I added this and it looks something, and it's like, well, that's not really what they were wanting. They wanted to see if you would, you know, conform. <laughs> right. And do that sort of thing. And also, I wasn't getting the best guidance. I wasn't getting the best teaching because high school teenage kid life for me was not good. Um, so I wasn't getting mentored in art in a way that would have, I think, helped me what, really you could have been embrace better? it. Oh, I see. I see. I, like, yeah, no, to be better. But to, just... to also like 
have a, a lifetime of art and not mm -hmm. this because you had a gap right between yeah. childhood and adulthood mm -hmm. yeah because it was in my early 20s when i had stopped doing art i want to i want to ask you I want to ask you about prep time. And I guess mm -hmm. I could ask you this about art or we could segue into podcasting. So it's up to you. But how do you balance the dynamics of prep versus presentation? Like like with art for me, like I take more time than I probably should fussing with it and getting it ready. And then when it comes time to draw, it's like five minutes, 10 minutes, quick, done, fast and loose. When it comes to podcasting or having a YouTube show, it's kind of the same thing, but I'm not as fast and loose during the interview. I want to over prep so that when I'm on air with a guest, I can really be considerate and invest. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? So like yeah. the dynamics of like prep and presentation are weird. Do you ever have a cutoff where you're like, this project shouldn't take this long? Or like my show's an hour. Why am I prepping for four days? You know what I mean? Do you yeah. have that? I, I it's definitely very different preps for artwork than it is for yeah. my live streams or just even a regular uh video essay. But they're both creative, right? Uh yeah. Like when I'm prepping for art, like a lot of it doesn't even feel like prep because I'm looking for the right image. So with this drawing that I just did. It was a bit of a challenge because I saw it in my head first. So I was looking for particular expressions, which are hard to get um, if you're looking for, this is the exact expression that I'm thinking of in my head. And right. even then, it's not that expression that I ended up with isn't the expression exactly the way I wanted, but it was close enough. But if I'm like, I'm going to draw Sam Cedar. Um, what I do then is I just go through videos and I'm like, that's an interesting expression. That's an interesting expression. And I just kind of capture them and then, you know, have 10 of them off to the side and then narrow it down and then print off a few. And then from those printed off, you narrow down even more as to which one I'm going to draw. Um, and then I just have like this sense of like, I have to clean off my, my drafting table, make it nice and fresh find the right piece of paper. I have to examine the paper because sometimes there's little specks in it. And if I were to do a drawing and there's a speck in it that I don't want in the drawing uh -huh. and it's going to be interfering, then it's going to drive me crazy and I can't do that. Um, wow. So I have to find the right piece of paper <laughs> and then kind of get everything all set up. Uh, tracing it can be a bit of a challenge because I have a hard time figuring out centering <laughs> when it comes to just the tracing part of it. Uh, I've messed up with that a few times. So I have to, I have to remind myself to be more aware of what I'm doing as opposed to throwing it on the piece of paper and um, just starting. Uh, but so, what if, oh, go ahead. So prep time for the art in general, it doesn't take that long because it really is just cleaning off the table and tracing. How like about setting, with your, with your show yeah. though, like. Okay, that's a whole other beast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so much time goes into my live streams before you even see it. Does it take away from the creativity or the creative factor? I don't think I'm being that creative in my live streams. Oh, really? I disagree. I think that you're... I, I First of all, I think being on air is pretty stale if you aren't a creative individual. On some level, yeah. I think you're making there's ambiance, ensemble. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like one thing I have to do is every time before a live stream, I have to record the intro to insert into OBS, and so occasionally I've forgotten to do that ahead of time. Uh -huh. um, but usually, what happens is I'll end up liking a whole bunch of things on Twitter that will lead me to news articles or stories I want to cover. The problem is I like too damn much on Twitter. I like too many things. And so it can take me a long time to go through things or a lot of things are related or there's these stories that I want to do, but it's a matter of then trying to find them through, through all the different likes that I did. And then I have to click them onto a separate tab and 
put them all there and then I have to arrange them all in order because I tried to do my live streams in a story order. So each uh, tab I go into kind of flows in the way of the narrative of whatever news story I'm talking about. Uh, but sometimes I have to then like I've clicked on these articles because I thought that they might be interesting but I hadn't read them yet so then I need to read them I need to watch the videos ahead of time and stuff and do all this sort of stuff and kind of get some thoughts in my head as to what I'm going to say so prep time like I start my live streams at six right now usually by the time the majority report is over because I like to watch it live when I can I then come into my studio and I start and it takes me almost that entire time to pick out the articles I want, narrow it down, put them in the order that I want, make sure that I have my OBS set up properly for what I want. Um, if I'm bringing a guest on to make sure that I found all of their social media things, I've actually wisened up on that one a bit and I actually have a Word document that has all the contacts. So like for you, it's your name plus all the different links to your contacts. So I just have to copy and paste it in. Um, Cause quite often there's, uh, I'll cover the same people over and over again for different things. So now I just have to open up that contact page and be like, copy paste. I don't have to track them down anymore. I call that being aggressively minimal. And it, what I mean by that is I do all the work on the front end. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a well-oiled machine, but some things are done way ahead of time once, and I never have to do them again. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of work for a few days or a week or two, and then all that's over. And it, now it's just push a click of a button. Yeah. That kind of allows me to address things that go wrong, because they always yeah. do. Yeah. And so, you have been instrumental in helping me in, in the early days of this. It was such a nightmare and I relied on you for so many things and, and we would have Skypes and Zooms and test things out and that, oh my gosh, that was so helpful. Like I, I'm endlessly in your debt for that. Well, I try to pay it forward because I had help. To be fair, it wasn't enough help as I needed to start with, <laughs> but it was enough to it get me going. Is. Yeah, there's no way you're going to get all the help you need. <laughs> uh, and there's still a lot of help that I need with certain things to just figure out certain things and stuff. Um, but uh, I, it's a lot of learning as I go. But I want to pay it forward when I can to like thank the people who helped me when I began and, uh -huh. you know, to help other leftists get up and going with their projects and stuff. But um, yeah. You consider so, yourself a leftist? I'm progressive. Left. Does political typology mean anything to you do you Not bother anymore. with it? It, it it used to but it gets so morphed it, it gets because there's these leftists that you see online but then there's different types of leftists there's the um reactionary left versus you know activist left and even within that different types of left and, and it's just to say you're of the left these days it doesn't narrow things down too much anymore yeah so yeah but you're coming at it you're curating these stories you're organizing your thoughts and comments about them you're presenting to your audience something from a political angle or or mm -hmm. you're coming from a direction right yeah. does that mean that you want to influence the viewers are you trying to change minds or are you just trying to provide context with these stories that you think are important or entertaining or need to be talked about well part of the reason why getting into live streaming just seems so natural especially with politics was because there was a lack of representation of you know people that weren't white men <laughs> and at that time i thought i was a white woman white i definitely am <laughs> <laughs> don't get much more pale than I am and still look healthy. Um, but it wasn't until I got on Twitter and stuff and started opening up my eyes and seeing more examples and representation out there that I started to realize things like, oh, I'm non-binary. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it had always been there my entire life. Like I had been saying it out loud, but the language just simply wasn't there. The representation 
wasn't there because the few gender fluid people or non-binary people I knew before then were nothing like me. But then once I got on Twitter and I started seeing more examples and stuff, it's like, oh no, that definitely is me. That is definitely me. And then once it kind of clicked, it really clicked as to like, that makes so much sense. Like just looking back at my life and the same with the autism. Like again, I knew some people who were on the spectrum, but they were nothing like me. But then as soon as I get on Twitter and stuff and seeing other people talk about it, having anecdotes from their life that it's like, you could have pulled that from my life. They, it, it just, it resonated so, so much. And then once I started to connect the dots and then think back in my past, it's like, okay, this makes so much sense now. You know, um, when you and I connected originally, that was peak Twitter. That was the mm -hmm. best Twitter had ever been in my experience. And I was on it, got off it and got back on it. And that was like, oh. we were riding the crest yeah. of the wave. That was great. Do you think it'll ever get back there? If Elon Musk goes away, yes. Well, yeah. Because I then... think there's a lot of desire to go back there. And if his influence goes away, then I think there's enough people that because even with all the hostility, the negativity, the Bots. trolls and stuff, yeah. it's still the only place that offers what it does the way it does. I mean, like, if Blue Sky had DMs, yeah, game changer. But right also, <laughs> yeah, like just as a resource for getting political commentary, news, clips, articles, videos... Uh, learning what's out in the world because a lot of people are reluctant to give that up because of the platforms that they've built up over the years, the followings that they've built up over the years. And so, yeah, sure, a lot of these journalists can move over the blue sky, but they're not going to have nearly the same reach that they still have, even with all the trash heap that Twitter has become. So, huh. yeah, what's what something that oh, you right, would... representation? That's yeah, what we were talking about. Anyway, um, so. When I would see a lot of political commentary online, I was usually seeing it from a lot of similar perspectives. And so from the perspective of somebody living with disabilities, mental health issues, dire poverty, uh, somebody who is not a white male, so queer, non-binary, there wasn't that much out there. And I was getting frustrated because they'd cover these stories, but miss a huge part of it that should have been discussed. Or they're having panels of people that can't personally relate to what they're talking about. Like reproductive rights. And it's like, okay, so this panel is all cis men or trans women. None of them are going to be pregnant. Uh, and so just having that lack of representation there. And so really, I wanted to help give a voice to people who are often left unheard to bring that perspective out there, to help educate people, because I'm under the belief that if more people knew what was actually going on in this world, in Canada, more people would care and do something about it. Like, I don't believe everyone would just sit by and let what's happening happen, but they don't know it's happening. They, they live in their bubbles, they're comfortable there, so... Part of it is they don't want to wander outside of their comfort zone. They don't want to face the reality of what we're dealing with. But I think for a lot of people, once they're actually confronted with it and they see it for what it is, and they have somebody who's talking about it and can make sense of it, it's hard for a lot of people to just turn away and pretend they didn't see it. And I think just even when we see what's happening over in Gaza, with the Palestinians right now and the growing support that they're getting, it's because for the first time, a lot of people are seeing it. You know, it's not hidden away. It's not coming through a filter. They're out, they've, their bubble has been breached with this information. And now that they know it's happening, they can't, they, they can't just do nothing. And I think the same would be true if it came to, if people knew what it's like to live with disabilities in this in this country, you know, the way that we're treated, the dire poverty that we're forced to live in, but the average person doesn't know how little we're expected to live off of, you know, the way that we're treated, the way that we're constantly under stress about, you know, being kicked off of it, 
about the fact that our entire checks can't cover market rent. So then we're stuck if we have to move and the situations that we're in. I think if more people actually not only knew what the government was doing, but understood people living with disabilities, because so often they're like, well, why don't you just get a job? Right. And okay. they don't understand what it's actually like to live like this and that nobody wants to live with a disability. This isn't something I was thinking of when I was a kid that I wanted to be absolutely insane and crazy and have to be medicated my entire life. This does uh, raise a question I wanted to ask you because you and I, well, I, I don't know if you and I joke or, or if I'm the one joking and you're enduring it, but we, we have a back and forth about my complete and utter lack of knowledge about Canada. And to be fair, it's not my fault because as an American, I'm not required to know about foreign lands. But on a serious note, is there anything you think Americans should know about Canada that they don't? Um, maybe something we should put our support behind or an issue that, that we should help keep in the spotlight because... For some reason, this is another thing I always wonder about. Americans have this idea of Canada as being peaceful, neutral, safe and sound, um, the best place to live. And, you know, I don't want you to trash talk your country. But oh, that just I do can, that all the time. That's that, okay. That, but, like, I'm not asking to do it. But that, that just cannot be the reality of the situation, right? So is there anything going on in Canada that Americans could be more supportful of that would also help a, help us educate people on the fact that our neighbor is in need as much as anybody else in the world, right? Uh, well, I think what it comes down to is a lot of the problems and issues that you guys have, we have up here just the same. Right. And there I think you go. the most important thing to know is how much we actually have influence over each other. Because Americans like to think that since Canada has such a small population and we're the good guys and all this sort of stuff, that we have such little influence over you guys. So it doesn't matter. But it's like, uh, look at who your right wing influencers are. Where did they come yeah. from? A lot of them are Canadian. And you see, the right seems to have figured this out, that they have a lot of support on both sides of the border. And that makes their movements stronger by far. So whenever you hear about the freedom convoy up here and stuff, there's American money going into it from the right wing. And whenever there's right wing rallies down in the States, you have Canadians traveling down there to help support that. Like they support each other big time and they influence each other big time. Like if Jordan Peterson feels like there's a law up here infringing on his freedoms, he gets right-wing commentators in the states who are american to comment on them to put pressure on them the premier of alberta recently to tucker carlson said can you put this other politician in your crosshairs like literally said crosshairs mm -hmm. because she didn't like the policies that this liberal mp was putting through and that is dangerous and that is what they're doing and I think a lot of Americans like to look up at Canada as an example of what they can be without realizing it's a fantasy. Like this lifeboat that think they can go to has a lot of holes in it. And if America wants to break out of what they're into and use Canada as that example, then you want to make sure that we're that good example. Because the reason why your fight for health care is so strong is because you have so many people constantly saying, look what's happening in Canada, just across the border, they have universal health care, and we can have that too. Just look at that example right there. So what happens to your movement when that's no longer the case here? And right. we are heading that way very fast. And a lot of people don't realize it because they're too distracted by what is happening in the States. But we don't have universal health care up here. You know? Yeah. Eye care, ear care, medication, mental health is not covered under our universal health care. And the conservative governments and the provinces and stuff have done such a good job of stripping away our health care that people are actually starting to think, you know what, maybe this privatization can help. Like it has gotten to that point where they're actually thinking, 
more privatization maybe will help. And there's not enough pushback from Americans saying, what the fuck are you guys doing? That's a big one. Because the thing is, is that Canadians will not listen to other Canadians, but they'll listen to Americans talk about Canadians. And you can oh. see that even with like Doug Ford, the premier of Ontario. And there was a lot of pushback about something or other. And he didn't care. He didn't care. He didn't care until um, a big Washington Post article about him or something came out about it. And then all of a sudden he's he's up in front of the mics like this is just isn't what you think it is. Like he's actually trying to defend his position because he didn't care when Canadians were calling him out. But as soon as the Americans start calling him out, that's when he cares. And that's what it is with a lot of our politicians. Like Justin Trudeau doesn't give a shit about what Canadians think. He does care about what the world stage thinks and world funny? stage settler colonial world stage. Um, there are so many voices online these days in this space, in our space, mm -hmm. um, covering American politics from Canada, sometimes covering Canadian politics from America, mainly when it's like Jordan Peterson or somebody swallows a bee. Um, there are, which only happened the one time, I think, but anyway, there are, um, yeah, I wish the left would flood the zone more. I wish we would tie things back to a single issue you're mm -hmm. reporting on a story, you're commenting on a story, and you tie it back to, I don't know, labor or healthcare, whatever. Um, but do you think it's irresponsible of your average YouTube show host or streamer um, or, or even just social media politico? Because sometimes there's these really popular accounts online, and you're like, well, who is that anyway? <laughs> is that one person or an organization? Um, do you think it's irresponsible of them to shine a light on topics without qualification or background. Like it, it's one context? thing. Well, okay. So like we more, we want more diversity, right? In the people that are commenting on the news and reporting the news. It can't just be white guys. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we want people to be qualified to talk about it. Like, right. If I covered politics du jour, or, or let's say I'm just talking about Gaza all the time. I know nothing about it. I'm just covering it. Is it okay that I'm keeping it in the spotlight because it's an important issue right now? Like, I, important issues playing it down. You know what I mean? It's a serious thing that we need to talk about. But there's a lot of people out there talking about it. They have no qualifications. They have no background. They have no degree or anything that would... They're not even journalists. And then at the end, they go, and that's what's happening in Gaza subscribe for more content like this hit that like button you know what i mean like yeah, is it responsible yeah. is it not responsible I'm, because uh, i'm asking for myself here i'm mm -hmm. trying to weigh this i don't know what to think well don't expect everyone to be able to cover everything that, and yeah. i i think there's a problem when you know there's a lot of pressure put on some content creators to cover certain subjects but they might not be subjects that they are particularly comfortable with or know a lot about but then they're like well why aren't you covering this and it's like don't expect like there is too much out there for any one person to be able to cover and cover in a rounded way uh yeah so, i just wouldn't want to be the channel that's mm -hmm. like wow how'd you get su successful and it's like mm -hmm. all my commentary on democracies now reporting on gaza mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, like well okay buddy what like, you know me, what i mean yeah, like for me, when I cover Gaza, I tend to stay away from the most horrific stories. And what I do there is quite often, I point people towards other journalists that are more aware of the overall picture, that have more information on the ins and the outs. Okay, and right. then I focus a very specific way of the Canadian connection. Mm -hmm. So... This is what the Canadian politicians are saying about it. This is what can Canada uh, stopped their funding to UNRWA. You know, and I'll talk about that and how our politicians are affecting it. Right. I'll talk about, you know, our history with settler colonialism and how it's similar to what's happening there. And so I try to keep the Canadian perspective on this, knowing full well that the bigger story is out there and then I'll try to point people to like Owen Jones who covers this quite well or Mehdi Hassan who covers this quite well 
and I usually, uh, you know, bring forth from their articles. And I'll add like a human, like my personal perspective to it at times, just being a human being. But I don't get into like the Houthis attacking and like all the ins and outs and the whys and stuff because I don't know the full history. I'm just reacting to what I'm seeing now. Yeah, I feel like I get history lessons based off today's news and it's like, shouldn't you be qualified to talk about this? But then again, it's like, it needs to be, I mean, mm -hmm. infotainment, edutainers, this makes it more digestible. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, I think, I mean, in a lot of ways, I don't think this, but I, I think that more and more, because it's hard to trust big mainstream media corporations, they're not even networks anymore, um, not really, but like I feel like live live streaming and and uh, info info. Uh, Sam Cedar called himself an infotainer the other day, didn't he? He said he's doing infotainment. I think uh, so. It's, yeah, doesn't sound right when I say it out loud, but but edutainers, it's it's almost as valuable as actual journalism. It's not the same. I'm not making mm -hmm. that comparison. But I'm saying like you get the journalism and that journalist probably has to move on to another assignment. He's got another deadline. And this is where the edutainer comes in and goes, let me break this down. Let's look at different news reports about the same topic. Let's explain this in um, layman's terms. You know what I mean? Not news speak or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes you think you it's need... as important? Yeah. Like sometimes you need people to be able to um, digest the information and bring it out in a way that's more relatable to people. It's like if you were to read a medical journal or a, a court filing and stuff, we could read it, but it, it wouldn't resonate with us. Yeah. We wouldn't get it. We wouldn't get the nuance and stuff. And so you have people who are at least familiar with that language, but also familiar. So they like bridge the gap in a way. And they can bring in that nuance or that perspective or, you know, um, that human element to it. So it doesn't feel so technical. You're not just reading facts and stats, but you can bring in your own personal life. Like when Sam covers what's happening in Gaza and stuff, he brings in the fact that, you know, he is Jewish and... He was planting trees over in Israel when he was a kid and was brought up in that Zionist way of thinking and how he broke out of it type thing. And so you can see how he's taking it from his perspective. You can see how Emma's taking it from her perspective and how it's affecting her on the daily having to go over this horrid news. And it helps to let you feel not as crazy going over this because it's like, are, are you seeing the same things that I'm seeing? Sometimes it's almost like you're feeling like, like we're, we're, it's a genocide over there. We're seeing that, right? Like, it's not just me. It's an actual, why aren't our leaders calling it what it is? Like, right. And so it helps to have uh, people, even if they're not experts on it, uh, humanize it a little bit and, and make it easier for people to understand but also then bring on the experts or be able to point to the experts. So if you want the right. more nuanced, like the more ingrained, detailed information, you can get it. Um, you know, you were saying that Canadians can, are, are suddenly concerned with their, their look, so to speak, when, when Americans are talking about them negatively. Do you think that the media has an effect, though? Is that, is that just when, like... American politicians are talking about Canadian government officials or, or is it more like um, in the media? Because my ultimate question here is, do you think that like there's different levels to this question? Like, I think that independent alternative media affects mainstream media and how they present themselves and, and not to a large degree, but it does have an influence. And so then I wonder, does the media or the news have the potential to affect policy and maybe like, I don't know, campaign strategies or the way politicians conduct themselves. I mean, we have those standout clowns that just don't seem to ever change or go away. But what do you think? Does it have uh, potential? In the States? Yes. In Canada? Not so much. 
What's the media like in Canada, the mainstream media? Uh, very well in balance. It, it comes from... Is that sarcasm? Same, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I didn't see the um, S slash or whatever. <laughs> you can see the eyebrow go up. Um, okay. <laughs> our media is so middle of the road, but it's mm. very establishment based. Mm -hmm. So when you hear people talk about conservative policy in our media, it actually sounds rational. <laughs> like it, it sounds like, oh, so if these conservatives take over, it's not so bad. But it's yeah. like, no, it's bad. It's really bad if these conservatives take over. Um, it is always a little bit more biased towards um, making right wing policies look better. You know, the way that Justin Trudeau is attacked is very different than the way Pierre Polyev is attacked. If Pierre Polyev is attacked. And so sometimes the media can get a little bit more friendly with one than the other, but it always falls down to which one better serves the establishment at the time. Right. And then that's who our media will be more friendly with. But I can't say that the coverage, because we actually have a little bit more regulations when it comes to that sort of thing, would sway the public one way or the other. It has to be like a mass movement from the politician, their volunteers, getting up, speaking engagements, um, you know, pitching policies that people want to hear and, and being more personable and things of that sort. Um, it, it's not so much the media because the media has its hits and misses. Like it can, you can see interviews with some of our uh, news anchors and they're doing their job. Like they're calling them out on these awkward situations and stuff. And it doesn't matter if they're on the right or the left and they'll do this. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have the same social influence because I think the Americans, you guys tend to tie in a lot of um, societal issues with your news, where ours is just plain, flat, dry news. Right. Do you, uh, do you, um, I always ask people if, They'd rather be president or advisor. But I think, what do you guys have up there? Barons? Kings? Something like that. Yeah. Prime minister? Uh, <laughs> Would you rather be prime minister or advisor? Doesn't matter. Really? Does the prime minister not have advisors? <sighs> you mean it doesn't matter in terms of how the government operates or to you personally? Uh, We have a parliamentary system up here. The prime minister doesn't have any power on his so, own, on their own um the, but he, they're he the has face. to be like party leader at least right? yeah they're the face of the party uh and they have a lot of influence over what they want but they they don't have the power to make any unilateral decisions what's the point yeah um, Does he so I would like to very day, much even? be a dictator of Canada. Okay. I got you. All right. And Benevolent, I would also I like assume. better news in Canada because, yeah, it is, it's frustrating. Um, There was just a couple other things on the media that I wanted to touch on. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. We have right-wing influenced media as well. So like if you a look Fox at, News or... Yeah. Uh, Just as bad. Um, what's it called? I want to look it up. Rebel News. Oh. Uh, also, like the National Post is very, it's a right wing rag. Um, so you do have to be careful because we do have some mainstream media that's a little bit more balanced, but then we also have ones that are heavily influenced for conservatives, right wings owned by the, what is it, the Mercers or something like that? The people or, uh, who own the media around the world or whatever. We have that up here, yeah. too. Um, Murdoch. Like, the Toronto Sun is very tabloid-esque, right-wing. Um, and then of the establishment middle-of-the-road stuff, again, it is very much for the status quo. So coverage on what's happening in Gaza, it's not good. It, it's usually... Oh, focus on what Hamas did and all the people that they killed. And it's like, oh, some people have just 
somehow died over in Gaza for some reason without actually seeing what Israel has done. Uh, so there is still a lot of that, a lot of biased uh, reporting and headlines and how things are covered. So you do have to be careful. You do have to read between the lines sometimes. There is no mainstream left news in Canada. There's independent media in Canada that's left wing, but there's no, nothing you would find on like cable TV. Wow. Um, do you, does Canada have like their own Area 51? Do you guys get as worked up about aliens as we do? Like, cause I always wonder why, why don't the aliens crash somewhere besides the United States, you know? When it comes to that sort of media entertainment thought, we're just the same. We're the same. Oh, so you have like an Area 51 up there? No, or? we have your Area 51. See, that's what I mean. You don't have your own. Like, why do we have it? Why is it always our pilots that saw something? Why are the... Because it's so ridiculous to think if aliens came here, they'd go straight to America and check no, us out. Like, that it, makes no sense. It's just a numbers game because your population is like 10 times ours. So okay. you have like 100 stories to 10 of our little minor stories that don't get picked up on the bigger news networks. Uh, like we, we have our own stories up here. It, it's all the same when it comes to that sort of, you know, aliens, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah. Mysteries of the unknown it's all the same do you believe in aliens paranormal anything yeah. like that oh, oh yeah. really all that sure okay are aliens just like intelligent beings or are we talking plant life <laughs> all of the above oh really okay do well, you the think they've been is here billions of years old you know like there's going to be intelligent life out there and it's um, growing but mm -hmm. like do you or expanding but do you um do you think they've been here this falls into the category of I neither believe nor disbelieve. <laughs> sure, oh. it's possible. How but I have, have you, no proof. How long have you been here, Sandy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, sure, it's possible, but I have no proof. But then also, yeah. if you're just looking at it numbers wise, they could have been here a million years ago. Yeah. Like, why, why would they suddenly appear right now in this? Like, if you look at the history of the planet, we're like a little speck of... Um, you know us as a developed species i think uh, if they were so, here they're comparing us to other places yeah. they've been because obviously they weren't just here right yeah and and could they be here now sure i find it unlikely there's no proof so i'm not going to say yes but it, it's it could be maybe not like it, it it's one of those things there's no proof one way or the other and I live in a world where, technically speaking, it is possible. But why would they be hiding themselves? Well, if you observe this planet, I would hide. <laughs> like I would, I would I'd, not want to come up to the population. I'd get bored. Pretty. I'd say, um, okay, I see how you guys do this. But Pretty the thing boring. is, is the way that we see it in in movies and stuff like that. We can't imagine what it would be like to have been a, a species that developed on another planet and what their way of thinking is like the idea that we could even communicate is so far stretched like they could be here standing in front of us right now and we wouldn't even recognize what they are because we're so different in just the way that we think and the reasons why they would come here is nothing that we could ever imagine but humans are so human centric you know this idea of like ooh, independence day we just infiltrate the mothership and upload a virus because somehow our memory stick is compatible with their system <laughs> you know? yeah i always think of it as like shapes you've never seen colors mm -hmm. you can't imagine yeah that's how i i try and break it down because when somebody says you wouldn't recognize it i'm like well what do you mean and they're like mm -hmm. it's a smell you've never smelled it's a taste you've never had well, um, you just, you look at all the life forms on this planet and the way that they sense things and see things that are so outside of what we can do. And then some things that we can do that they simply cannot. And we're talking about a planet that has completely different DNA structures going on and whatnot. Like it's, 
Like it's possible they've been here. It's possible that they've tried talking to us. It's possible that they're infiltrating us and look like us. It's highly unlikely. Um, but yeah. I, I don't, this, I used to have these thoughts when I was a kid. You know, when people would say like unicorns, oh, unicorns is so stupid. Like they're just fantasy. And it's like, okay, they're not real here. But in this expansive universe that we have, and in the billions of gazillions, trillion stars out there, what's to say that there isn't a unicorn somewhere? Yeah, my, know, it, my it might not is, be ever be here, but why not somewhere else? I always say, and I had this discussion with a guy who's a firm believer, and I was like, okay, let's say they are here. We still have to work these BS nine to five jobs. Nobody has health care. We're dying by the thousands because mm -hmm. we're hungry. Mm -hmm. Who cares if they're here? It's yeah. not changing anything. So I don't care. Yeah. With me, unless they take me with them. Uh, okay. <laughs> What's the point? But like, I, I'm just like a curious type of person. Like I would love to have like conversations with them and just like talk to them and look at them, like look at humanity from an outside perspective. As somebody who's autistic, I feel like I'm doing that anyway for the most part. So it'd be nice to just have somebody be like, yeah, those humans. <laughs> um, yeah. But I'm also a very curious person when it comes to science and, and things of that sort. But I also recognize it's like, do we know how this universe started? No, we have theories. Right. I would love to know the answer, but does the answer change anything? Like, if we finally send out, like, absolutely 100% sure there's no, no ounce of doubt it was the Big Bang. So? Um, okay, this brings me to uh, one of my favorite parts of the interview. Uh, and it's a good segue because it's pretty fantastic. Um, do you, have you ever, or do you? read comic books because i never let my guests off the hook without first recommending a comic book to them mm -hmm. have well, you? i've mentioned it before and i'll say it again uh i used to read a lot of heavy metal magazines right that's right okay that's right nice mm -hmm. that's that's cool <laughs> and part of it is since we're talking about the science fiction type stuff just the different worlds and stuff that they would build in there and the little snapshots of different realities and stuff that you could see in there. And then just the different types of artwork that you would get in and, yeah. you know, these fascinating stories that you start off with, like, because, you know, you don't have to be committed to a, a long multi-year storyline. It's just these little things to tantalize the uh, imagination and yeah, the different styles and different concepts of what could be out there or, or different realities and stuff. It just, you know, it, it's kind of like a uh, twilight zone almost in comic book form, yeah. but more yeah, adult like yeah. and horror related. Yeah. I love anthology stuff. Okay. I've got one for you. This is wild. Now I lost my copy. I think I lent it to somebody or when I'm, or it's still packed from when I moved a few years ago, but I'm, I might have to, bite the bullet and buy a new one um it's a collection of some very old comics between 1941 and 1947 it's called novana of the northern lights by adrian dingle have you heard of novana okay check this out um predating wonder woman by a matter of months this is one of the first female superhero characters, and it's Canadian. Uh, Novana of the Northern Lights returns from the lost pages of Adrian Dingle's triumphant comics. Novana was one of the world's very first superheroines, predating Wonder Woman by several months, and is among the ranks of the first Canadian superheroes to emerge after Canada placed an embargo on U.S. luxury goods in World War II. Uh, first appearing in 1941, Novana was tasked with protecting Canada's northern lands using the powers of the northern lights. Novana could fly at incredible fast speeds, uh, become invisible, and even turn into dry ice, which sounds like a 
very Canadian thing to me for some reason. Uh, she used her great powers to ward off Nazi invaders, of course, shady fur traders, subterranean mammoth men, and interdimensional ether people. There's even a storyline where she fights evil whites, which is just awesome because she's, um, well, I don't want to ruin it for you, but it, the, the character is also not white, which is oh, really pretty bold for 1941. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for that era, that would be, yeah. Yeah. So for the first time since her story ended 1947, Nirvana's complete adventures have been collected and reprinted in one single volume with over 320 pages of artwork by her creator, Adrian Dingle. And it's, it's, um, it's, I mean, the old school art was so artistic. That's another reason why you can see like they, it, it's slightly unrefined because of just they had limitations back then with with reproducing original art. But you can you can also see that they're using like a brush and a pen to make comics, mm -hmm. you know. So I thought you would appreciate the artistic value and quality. Also, it's Canadian, and also they were breaking the glass ceiling or breaking new ground all the way back then, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and it's it's just fun old school comics. So and it's the kind of thing where you don't have to read it start to finish and you can get a paperback for like twenty five bucks, cheaper used. So if you read it, let me know what you think. Um and I am gonna seek out some heavy metal because I'm glad you've reminded me of that. I've been neglecting mm -hmm. my heavy metal. I yeah, know you I have a show read one in a yeah, I haven't read the heavy metal magazine in a long time and I'm actually now that I'm talking about it and remembering them it's like maybe I should just pick up a couple copies. Yeah. Go to I've the comic book, comic, comic book stores around here and uh, grab some. Oh, yeah. I think everyone should make a point to visit their local comic shop on a regular basis, especially if you haven't in a while. Now, I know you have a show on Wednesday, right? I try. <laughs> so, um, or just plug whatever you want before yeah. we wrap. Yeah. <laughs> There's the cat. Nice. Hello. Um, yeah, so I have my YouTube show, Left of the Box. I try to do live streams. I'm trying to make them consistent, like Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays at 6 p.m. Eastern. But uh, depending on how much I burn out or just don't have it in me necessarily. So the plan is to do one on Wednesday, but I'll have to see where I am at it. Okay. Um. But I'm also trying to get back to doing just video essays that I used to do, mm -hmm. uh, where I'm just pick a story that I'm talking about and focus on that and script it out and have it up there. Uh, so I'm trying my best to, to get on top of all of that. But then I'm also trying to clip my videos, to, which just the amount I mean, of work that has I to know. go into this is just <laughs> I know. crazy. Because It's not easy. <laughs> yeah, I did a show... What was it, Sunday? Did I? No, I skipped Sunday. So Friday. I haven't even gotten around to clipping that show on Friday. Um, and that takes like a day between re-watching it, finding what I want to take out, then putting it in the different kind of layout that I have, but taking out the little gaps because when I'm doing live streams, I tend to pause a lot. Sometimes it's almost like I'm speaking in a sentence and then it's like buffering happens. It's because dramatic. I'll literally just stop halfway through a sentence like that because I'm trying to think of the next thing to say. And the reason why I'm pausing is I'm trying to cut back on the ums and ers. Oh, I see. Yeah, there was a couple times tonight where I interjected and was like, oh, Sandy might not have been done that. <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's very dramatic pause. Yeah. But also, I have a web page that shows my art. Yes. Yeah. I am going to put links to all of this stuff in the description mm -hmm. of this video. So anyone and everyone watching should scroll down and please check that stuff out. Subscribe to Left of the Box. Look at the artwork. Are you still taking commissions? <laughs> still taking them. That assumes I ever got any. I mean, that's <laughs> people should be taking uh... you up on that. Uh, you want to talk yeah. about a gift, like a birthday or a Christmas gift or something like that. If you give somebody one of those portraits, they will freak out. 
like, like that I, is... I get they're not cheap but they're, well they're not worth supposed to be it's they're... not now the value of something like that isn't supposed to be what we uh, the construct affordable yeah it's uh, the value of the art that has nothing to do with retail or traditional mm -hmm. price values but also prints are for sale and they're much more affordable go. to the average person uh, more accessible maybe yeah more accessible <laughs> um <laughs> I'm but, very serious yeah. about this. <laughs> I, I do take, so far, my only customer has been my mom. Mm. Oh, who do you think that. buys my stuff first? Come on. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I've gotten, like, I did a commission sort of recently because somebody donated towards uh, one of my cat's Frodo's, his vet bills. A stranger donated over $500 towards wow. his vet bills. And so in honor of that massive donation, um, one of the things that I'm trying to do on my web page is people can donate towards portraits for somebody living with poverty. So That's somebody amazing. who would never be able to afford a portrait like this, um, when I get enough money in that would cover the cost of one, I put out a call for people living with poverty and randomly pick one. And um, then at no cost to them, they'll get a portrait. And so in honor of this, $500 donation I did that and only one person entered the draw so they got the portrait so that's kind of like my first commission I guess I saw you post about this by the way mm -hmm. that's yeah. pretty cool I um, think that's great but if more people just want to donate to the cause you can um you know contact me on the webpage and stuff um or Sandy Lopez at gmail for art and then Left of the box for left of the box YouTube stuff, but then Sandy Lovitz at Gmail about the art. Well, Sandy, thank you for coming on tonight. I really do appreciate it. Um, once again, helping me out. <laughs> I'm very grateful for all of your support and your friendship. And and clip that, and don't forget. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much mm -hmm. um, to both of you, you and your co-host <laughs> slash sidekick. This one is Lanier. Lanier. Now, where'd you get that name? If people are sci-fi junkies, they should know. Uh. Babylon 5. Oh. Oh, okay. Now I know. Thanks for clarifying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, everybody, we're back here Wednesday night for double shows and then rescheduling the Kamal Franklin interview for Friday night, along with everything else we do on Friday night. So we got a whole week ahead of us. We'll see you there. But for now, it's Monday because, Sandy, do you know? Mondays are back. I'm